Hello everyone, I am um, really excited to have uh, with me Mr. R. Gopal Krishnan, um, the CEO of uh, Mindworks and uh, ex-director of Tata Sons. Uh, great to have you here sir and uh, today's uh, interview will be on uh, digital and digital disruption. Um, I know you uh, write a lot about leadership. In the context of uh, digital, has, has leadership evolved into something new as compared to let's say 10-15 years ago? from the industrial age, has leadership as a concept evolved? Well, leadership is always evolving, anyway. But the vectors around which it's evolving are influenced by its circumstances. Yeah. And digital is part of the circumstance. Yeah. Um, and therefore, it, they, they have a interaction between leadership and digital. So there's no doubt in my mind that if digital is like oxygen, it doesn't matter whether you're sitting in a room or out in the play field yeah. or you're a hockey coach or a, a tennis player uh, or an executive sitting in an office, the oxygen is changing you. Yeah. So uh, leadership is definitely changing and influenced by digital. Correct. And in what ways do you think uh, leadership today or leading an organization today is very different from leading an organization. Yeah, you see the fundamental philosophical pivot on which leadership has, thinking about leadership has evolved over the decades. Yeah. I've been around long enough to use the word decade. Uh, is uh, leadership, if I just take Y, which is today, and Y minus 50, which is when I began my career. You know, in those days, leadership was about having superior knowledge, superior skills. Uh, you were a bit of a cognoscenti compared to the guys who worked for you. Yeah. You told them how to think of a problem. You gave them suggestions and solutions. You trained them. Um, if they did it wrong, you know, the school teacher metaphor. Yeah. Uh, school teacher sort of relationship. And you were supposed to be wise, and if you didn't know the answer, they see even the boss didn't know the answer. Yeah. It feels like a very different world, yeah. but I have lived in that world, I began my career there. So you look up to your boss, the words used were also suggestive of that, you yes. look up to your boss. Yeah. Your boss gave you mentorship and guidance and, yeah. and so on and so forth. Now from an interaction of several with one leader, it is now a sort of circular, multiple interactions. Yes. So the leader has ceased to be the fountainhead of knowledge, experience. He may be, in a particular situation, the most experienced guy. Yeah. In a particular discussion, he may have the greatest knowledge. I'm not suggesting that he's an ignoramus who's sitting there. But I'm saying that it's no more centered around him. Yeah. Uh, if I apply the gra Newtonian gravity principle, he's not the center of the earth. Right. He's not the tip of the magnetic field. Yeah. Uh, because you know, the system has changed completely now. And to that extent, uh, the real task of a leader is to create an atmosphere where humility, curiosity pervade. Whereas 50 years ago, your attempt was to demonstrate how to make knowledge pervade. Yeah. And the superior knowledge gave you a sense of superiority in market and position yeah. and inevitably leading to a superiority of arrogance. Yeah. So you see that vector is now completely modified. Right. There are vestigial traces of it, so don't, yeah. don't imagine that it's vanished so long as human nature is there, it will be there. But today the task of a leader is to instill humility. Okay. It's damn tough to instill humility. Yeah. Especially the leader is supposed to be the one who's leading that effort because he's probably one of the more arrogant guys right. in the system. Uh, it is to promote curiosity. Right. How do you promote curiosity? And I don't think there's a pat answer. But I think that is the real goal. Okay. So if I take two keywords, 
and look around and say, do leaders today, what did I do when I was a leader in a large company until the other days? I don't know whether I did it well enough. Now that I'm a bit distanced, I'm able to sit and see, hey, maybe I should have done something like this 10 years ago. That's, I think, the humility in your speaking. Right no, now. it is a reality. Because I can imagine people buzzing in and out, boss, there's a tag, there's an email, there's this, that, shall we do this, come, you come to me at 10.30. Yeah. You know, you're caught up in a particular kind of a routine. Well, when you have stepped back from it, you're able to think and say, not that I'm going to live the last 10 years again, but when I see somebody else in the equivalent of the last, my last 10 years, yeah. I say, what the hell is he doing which is different? Yeah. So, the great orator leader is the one eulogized from Cicero to Demosthenes and, and now the great listener leader. Yeah. So, you see the words used are very different. Yeah. The skills used are not so clear. How do you listen better? How do you make people curious? How do you keep people humble? And if you have to lead that way, right. and you are sitting uh, like the king on his throne, then a lot of uh, implications for you. Right. That's a fascinating answer. It brought to my mind uh, what Satya Nandana talks about from a know-it-all person to a learn-it-all person. Right. So I think it's about the humility to say, I don't know, but I will learn it. Right. So that I think instills a growth mindset as well. You see, the old model of leadership said, you are here, you are going to take your company or your department or your function to there. Yeah. So this is sort of dystopia, that is sort of utopia, just move. Uh, the fact of the matter is, that's only a part of the journey and then there is another journey ahead and so on and so forth. Yeah. So your, what I think Kevin Kelly, who writes, uh, is a, is a digital journalist for yeah. a better word, he says you are not in a journey from dystopia to utopia, you are in a journey through protopia. Right. And what he means by protopia is you are always changing. Yeah. Whatever you've done is, it gets unfixed yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. So you buy a new gadget, it's not going to be valid. You did a, you know, the, one of the most irritating things to an old timer is to see your apps getting updated every morning. <laughs> <laughs> you get a number with a circle on it right. and then you blindly press it yeah. and everything gets updated. Yeah. And you say, why couldn't each app have done a decent job earlier? Yes. But this is not like a car. Yeah. That you made a car and then the car can be serviced for the next five years. Yes. This is on the run, on the hop, where everything is changing. Right. And therefore you need a mindset. Yes. Thank God I can just press a button and it gets updated. Right. Imagine if I had to go to a workshop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it would be one of the most, it would be as uh, strenuous as providing my PAN card and my Aadhaar card for everything from brushing my teeth to opening a bank account. <laughs> so this, um, I think, is a relentlessly iterating world, right? The digital world is very different from the industrial world in that respect that in the industrial world, there is a state of dumbness. You are done with something. Whereas in the digital world, there is no state of right. dumbness. You are constantly iterating over it. Right. Right. So, um, so it is just like the transition from the artisanal world to the industrial world. Right. In the artisanal world, oh, I made this chair. And uh, why do you want to make a million chairs at it? Yeah. Because there is an art in making a chair. I made this wine. I wrote it in a particular way. Well, I made this dish for you. Yeah. Culinary. These are all arts. Yeah. Now, if you want to industrialize food, you can imagine the challenge you have with the dilettante. Yes. Yeah. And uh, he says uh, it's class. Yeah. But you have to make a uh, hundred dosas per minute rather yeah. than one dosa in a hundred minutes. Yeah. You see the challenge. Right. That's artisanal to industry. Right. When you go to industry, so repeatability was an irritation. Yes. The need to repeat and have scale. Yeah. Now when you go from here to there, it's not the repeat to the scale, but the process is changing all the time. Yes. And so we go through that adjustment. Yes. That's a great example. So it's it's wonderful um, listening to you using analogies from food to culture to history. Because I think the word digital has now become a bit of a Brahminical word. Right. And uh, I think it needs to be pulled down from its pedestal and right. demystified. demystified. Right. Because uh, if, like in Napoleon's court, you, everybody spoke French. Yeah. So the common guy who spoke Polish or German yeah. was excluded from the conversation. Right. And that's a great danger for digital. Yeah. 
that uh, geeky guys will have new four alphabet uh, combinations. Yeah. Smack. Yeah. And keep other people out of it. Right. Which is not their intention. Yeah. Because that will damage the ground on which they themselves are standing. Right. But it's happening a little bit and I believe that if a Dumbo has to understand it, you have to use metaphors and analogs so he feels comfortable with it. Right. Wonderful. So uh, just building on that particular point uh, on digital being inclusive. So right now you, you made a comment that maybe perhaps at this point it is so geeky that the common man doesn't get it. So what's the role of the leader in this uh, respect? Because one of the points of view that I've, I've been developing myself is without inclusion there is no innovation. You don't get diversity of ideas. Any, any thoughts on that front? No, I think uh, firstly that's one way to look at it. But uh, you get the other way to look at it, you get big innovation by exclusion. Now, these are philosophical ideas, you know, you can say that uh, the internet didn't come by, you know, a hundred guys walking on the streets of Boston writing yeah. code, yeah. or the Apple or the Mac did not come by a thousand guys sitting around the table and yelling at each other, yeah. uh, as sometimes the digital guys are want to show the offices of the innovation centers where yeah. yuppie people are talking. Yeah. But that's not the point. The fact is that never has innovation been a, a loan art. Yeah. It has always been like a billiard ball. Yeah. You might have hit the billiard ball in a particular stroke, but the ball has been hit around by a lot of people. Right. The con condition of the ball is influenced by many things that have happened before. Yeah. Uh, that's why I've written a book called A Comma in a Sentence, yeah. where where you place the comma makes a big difference and one single comma can change the meaning and the context of the sentence completely. Yes. And so each act of innovation, each act of procreation, each act of civilizing influence is a mere comma in a much longer sentence. Yeah. And if I use that sort of metaphor, then uh, it is important to have many people have a crack at it. Yeah. Uh, rather than uh, use the word inclusive exclusive, which is one way to put it. The democratization of the language yeah. and the democratization of the processes yeah. is very important. Yeah. And democracy, democratization is a good word for digitalization because voting was considered to be a very wise man's art. Yeah. Who had thought about all the factors and then he would vote. Yeah. So, I mean, do you know India became independent in 1947 and women had a vote? Everybody had a vote. Right. It's an act of great uh, forward thinkingness. But Switzerland had no vote for women till 1971. Yeah. For God's sake, I had begun my career by then. Right. So it didn't happen in Hitler's time. Yeah. So there are acts of great uh, faith that you do. Yeah. And to me, digital is an act of faith. Yeah. That a leader cannot shirk, he cannot admit that he knows. Uh, in fact, his virtue is in admitting he does not know. Yes. And allowing some guy to come and tell him what it is all about and looking for metaphors with which he is able to lodge it in his head. So I think it's a different world. Sure. So, uh, businesses today are talking about building ecosystem. It's not a pipeline anymore, so to speak. Uh, it's not about your products and your channel and your customers. How do you build a platform and, and integrate your offer with many other things that may be available out there? So in this new model, what's the role of a leader? From a command and control that you spoke about, what's the evolution of the leader in the context of an ecosystem? You know, I, I naturally I would take metaphors from my background and experience. Right. But metaphors help because uh, you make your point without... Uh, I love the tea shop. At one stage in my career, I was a managing director of a tea company. So I took a lot of interest in tea. Yeah. Uh, do you know that till 1575 or thereabouts, there were no tea shops in England and uh, when the men wanted to uh, congregate, they went to the ale house and when they go to the ale house, after one or two rounds, they are not talking sense anymore and they are blowing up a lot of money to the distress of their women at home. But since water was impure, that is the only way to get pure fluids into your body with other consequences. And like all technology, there are unintended consequences. So the arrival of tea into England created the first tea shop 
I think it was 1582. I got a record of that. Okay. Uh, uh, these are all things that you cannot prove, but you are willing to accept as symbols of history. Now, the tea shops have dramatically changed because people could congregate, yep. they didn't get drunk, and they could have a conversation. And I think the art of conversation in England, leading to the Enlightenment and everything else, the coffee houses, the tea houses, even today, Starbucks provides just yes. that. Yes. People say the internet is more important than the coffee. Right. They charge you 200 bucks for the coffee, you pay nothing for the internet. Right. So, the importance of people congregating and doing things is. Is, is important and no single guy there knows what's going on yeah but collectively somehow they know yeah something is moving right uh, this replicated itself in many ways i saw when i went to saudi arabia that i was getting 70 percent of the profits of my company from lipton tea bags i was astounded and then i found that the arabs there could not go to a bar yeah so they went to a tea shop and then they kept drinking yeah. tea yeah so the virtue of uh, congregation, there are several examples I have taken, ones that come, came to me in my career. Yeah. Uh, and that is the task of a leader. Yeah. There you did it because you wanted to sell more tea, yeah. not because you wanted innovation. Right. But, uh, I mean, do you know a simple thing like a ball pen got developed because of the coffee houses uh, that were prevalent in Budapest. Budapest had a very rich coffee house culture. And all sorts of people would congregate there and discuss. I'm sure 90% or 95% might have information. Mm. I have no idea because that's not recorded anyway. But 5% is recorded. And do you know that uh, Hungary has produced more Nobel Prize winners than any other country of its size and its sort of. Oh, I didn't know. And I said, why the hell? How come Hungary has produced so many clever guys? Now, there must be hundreds of reasons you can to the family system, the school system, but I have chosen one that I find uh, fires my imagination. The coffee house. Yeah. And uh, the coffee house allows people to sit. And the specific story of the ball pen, Laszlo Bairo was the guy who invented the ball pen. Right. He got the patent and got it off the ground. Uh, he is a great product of coffee houses. I didn't know. I wanted an ink which could dry up as soon as it touched the paper. And then the chemist says, that's crazy, you can't do that. And so on and so forth, the yeah. whole story is laid out in the records. So I think uh, it's uh, uh, the only way that innovation can happen. Sure, so the power of congregation, the power of the collective, and the leader's role is to basically bring people together. And, and I sense, I think there's a power... And not target. Yeah. Yeah. This is what will emerge at the end of... Right. And at the end of... Uh, Two hours or uh, two days of a conference, you say, well, we tend to do this. Uh, I've spent so much money. Have I got something out of it? Right. The ROI. The ROI. Yeah. I don't think it's wrong to look at it. Yeah. You, know, you can't keep having beach bums uh, sitting around and though once in a while a beach bum may produce something fantastic. You can't run your company on that basis. But uh, I think there is a uh, there is a value to intermingling and co-mingling, yeah. the diversity of ideas and you should provide an opportunity for those who want to do so in a company to do so. Yeah. That's a task of the leader. Whether you should frown and say it's outside the budget and many companies do this, including I have done it myself in my time. 10% cut on everything, 5% cut on everything. And it's unfortunately it is necessary. You can't run a company purely on the basis of that. But, uh, this co mingling, just like in the old days, they said, don't prevent people from going on a course. Yeah. You know, that's cutting the training budget. Well, the equivalent of that is don't cut down on co mingling. Right. That's where the energy comes. Right.